I think I won the nomination of the longest uh, name of the talk on this conference. And actually, I was surprised that there is a talk about Flink 2.0 in another room, and I expected that no one will be here and I can join that talk. <laughs> but uh, everyone is here. And so my name is Grevenikov Roman. I work for a company called Findify, and will call, tell you a couple of uh, anecdotes and horror stories about the Flink state serialization and how it works, and what are the problems of that, and how to solve them. And, but uh, before that, a short note about the company I work for, and it is kind of an important for the understanding why we stuck with the Flink state serialization problem. Uh, so I work at a company called Findify, and we do a search uh, for e-commerce. It's a white-labeled search, so most probably you never heard about Findify, but maybe you uh, visit a merchant and not even notice that the product catalog is done through the Findify backend, or the search results are ranked through our backend. It just looks organically, so there are a couple of like more than 1,000 stores running, it's a couple of millions of products indexed, and some traffic happening. And the main feature of Findify is that we do uh, search for ranking based, it's real time and personalized and depends on the way you browse the product catalog and search. So if, for example, you uh, start clicking on red products on the next product, page, product catalog page, maybe the red products will be promoted topper on the top because maybe you like red color, for example. But it's a bit more complicated with machine learning and so on. And a bit of the retarded drawing of the data flow in our application, it looks like, uh, so when someone asks us to do a search here, it's customer, and uh, we do like a regular search through the index. It was Elasticsearch before, now it's Lucene, but we get uh, some candidates results, like 500 product results to show, and then we rank them according to the past customer behavior we get from our data processing pipeline. And as we're really limited on the time budget, so we cannot spend one second here just going to database and getting some data from that, we try Try to pre-compute as many things as we can do to feed into the machine learning here, machine learning model here. So here, with the Flink, we do a lot of different aggregations and uh, feature value computations for the machine learning model. And uh, these stateful aggregations are um, not just the general counters, like how many pages used for there. They're usually scoped to some specific area, like number of pages used for a merchant, or maybe number of uh, searches made for this particular query for a merchant. Or it can be like nested scoping, like how many clicks uh, this product got on this particular collection of the products. So there is quite a lot of different scopes we compute at the same time. And these counters are not only counted from the beginning of the lifetime. It's also on the different time windows for different days. And uh, it's not only about page use, it's also add to cart event, purchases, uh, clicks, uh, and autocomplete events, and so on. Uh, but the question is, what will happen if you, and also we do some sort of estimations of the histogram, like what is the cl click distribution over some specific product collection? And what if you need to introduce a new aggregation here? Like you would like to compute something from that but also on 45 days. For sure, you can just sit and wait for 45 days until data organically will flow through your application, but most probably you have something better to do. And uh, usually you can just rebootstrap your state. So you record all the uh, events coming through your, through your Flink streaming application somewhere on S3, for example, and just use it afterwards to run your to recompute all the state based on the historical activity of the customers. And then, like for example, with the Flink 1.9, you can do the state processor API to make a save point and then restore on your live streaming job. Uh, it the data set can be different for different companies, like 10 to 50 terabytes. Is it large enough? For us, yes. For someone, it's like nothing. But uh, it's usually some sort of a balance between being either too slow or too expensive. And uh, I don't like waiting for my Flink job to complete. And But still, the main problem of job being even too expensive is that it does quite a lot of computations. And 
when you sit and wait and trying to understand what's going on, why I'm just waiting for it to complete, you might start lurking around trying to understand what is slow. For me, the easiest solution to get a general overview of uh, what's going on in a job is just to make a flame graph of the job, like sample it for a couple of minutes, hours, get the flame graph and get an overview of what's actually happening, what it is doing under the hood. <laughs> Flame graph, if you've never seen it, it looks like this. So it's some sort of a histogram of stack traces. So the wider the box here, the longer you spend on this particular stack frame. And for us, uh, if you check, uh, check this histogram, it looks like that we spent almost half of the time in the collector, like context collect on your processing functions, and these two, three heels are working with a state, like getting something from a map state, putting something on a state, value state, list state, so on and so forth. And this remains here are actually the business logic, which is quite disappointing that we're doing a lot of unrelated job here, and the business logic is so tiny here, no one even notices it. And, um, so but just, just some sort of an aggregated numbers. But it's not the problem with the Flink itself. It's usually every, everything is just straightforward. It's, and when something is happening really slow, I start asking the question to myself, am I not understanding, some, understanding something what's happening under the hood? And uh, most probably, usually, the answer is yes. And maybe, uh, did someone notice this type this log line somewhere on your uh, job, yeah? That's actually a hint uh, what, what's going on, that you're like paying quite a lot of money for nothing for, for your Flink job. Because uh, it means that your class uh, is not being able to be serialized or deserialized in a fast way, so it uses some sort of generic type, which is under the hood, the Creo serializer. And if your type is like integer or string. There is a plenty of different custom serializers written within the Flink runtime to serialize it effectively. If it's some sort of a compound type, it's a tuple in Scala or a Pojo in Java or case class in Scala, there is also a custom serializer which is efficient enough to, to work well. But if it's no, it's not the known or it's not case class or it's not, uh, not true Pojo, it's going to the Creo fallback. And is, is Creo that bad? Actually, if you read a lot of different benchmarks about Java serialization, you will know that Creo is itself quite fast. But the problem with the Creo is that it's extremely generic and can serialize the whole universe if it needs to. But that's actually the problem with the Creo. And let's have some sort of a benchmark. Uh, ah, so usually the Creo sneaks into your code base and you don't really even feel that it's something weird is happening. There is a special toggle on the first uh, execution configuration, like to disable Creo fallback, and usually when you disable Creo fallback, nothing runs at all. Just no, zero of my jobs are being able to run. And uh, but if you don't have enough money to fix your performance problems, you need to start thinking what can be done. So here is just a very short and tiny benchmark uh, uh, for serialization of different types. So uh, sorry for Scala, but I'm writing Scala, and if it was Java, it was just longer. And, but the idea itself is the same. <laughs> Um, so we have uh, two classes. One is a case class. It's like an improved version of the class from Scala if you never met it. And uh, the other one is just a class, like, like in Java, nothing, nothing fancy. And three benchmarks. The first one is using the case serializer from Flink. The second one is using the Creo. And the third one, as we are smart enough and know that we can register our own custom serializers with Creo, we register the custom one. So maybe it will become faster. And when you check the numbers for this synthetic, absolutely synthetic benchmark, you might notice that, OK, there is a difference. Maybe in a production, in a real world, the difference will be, won't be that dramatic, but still there is a difference. I won't throw assembly to your faces right now describing what Creo does here, but in general Creo maintains the object identity. So if you're serializing not just a plain case class, but some sort of a graph and you might have multiple references to the same uh, 
under the uh, same nested class. Crew will understand that it's the same class and will serialize a reference, and at the end it won't serialize it to deserialize it twice. It will be the same one. With the keys class serializer, it doesn't do any smart things because actually it's very weird to serialize this complicated data structures in Flink. But but that's actually the main reason why this this uh, the performance difference is so huge. But you might wonder that okay, the um, no one has the case classes like so 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 small. The, usually it's a bit larger, more events. For for our use case, for example, for page view, we have approximately 30 to 40 different fields describing what's happening. And uh, the difference if you serialize this thing with Creo and non creo is not like five times difference, it's two times difference. And we actually also observed the similar numbers on a production. So if you just dump stack traces from time to time from your process, you see that it's just struggling with Creo. That's the problem. Uh, and the easiest way if you write Scala to shoot yourself in the foot with Creo is uh, use something smart like algebraic data types. If you never wrote Scala, it looks scary, but it's actually not that scary. It's some sort of a, uh, it's like an interface, but it is enclosed and locked. So it means that from the event is a base type and there can be only two implementations of event like page view and purchase, and you cannot extend it anywhere else but here, which is useful for a Scala compiler that it can uh, hint you or even um, throw an error in the cases when you forgot to, about some specific subtype when you do matching on this base type. And uh, to see what will happen if we try to serialize this ADT, like algebraic data type structure with Creo, and we actually use a lot of sealed traits. Actually, we have this data model from our previous data processing environment. It was so it more like a legacy one. So it and it, it's really useful because you can move something shared uh, things to the base class, like uh, the merchant identifier timestamp, and you know that all the events are forced to have this particular fields. Um, but why and how Flink knows how to serialize and deserialize your types. So for example, you have a very trivial stream or batch processing application. You have a couple of elements, you multiply them and transform them to string. And uh, how Flink knows how to deal with your types. And if you see the definition of the map function, in Java it's much more uh, simple that you need to uh, supply this type information manually. But in Scala, there is a bit of a magic, and uh, you don't need to supply it, and this Scala compiler suppi supplies it to you. But when you see the definition of the map function here, uh, so you need to transform from one type to another, somehow, like to string, but watch for that. It's kind of a requirement that there should be, in this context, a type information for the result type. Uh, and what will happen, usually no one writes type information manually classes. No one, most probably no one even tried to write this type information manually. And usually in Scala, there is no such thing as this uh, type information. Th and, but usually, when you uh, forgot you're writing Scala code with a Flink, and you forgot to make this import, everything is red. And then you make this import, and everything is not red, which is nice. It seems like magic, but what's happening here? with this wildcat import. It's, it's kind of a magic, because here sits a macro function, which is, uh, generates a type information for you if it's not present, if, and if it knows how to do it. And, but it's technically not really a magic, and it's pretty straightforward to understand what's going on inside. So macro in Scala, in Java you do it manually, in Scala it, compiler does it for you, but it's actually a compiler plugin, so it's a code which is executed not on a runtime, but on a compile time, and it operates, it text takes your Scala code as an input, but not like a string, but some sort of a parsed uh, a, a, a syntax tree, and then trans can for look for some implicit request, like, okay, we need to know how to serialize strings. Okay, and let's just plug the string serializer type information for string right here if you want it. That's actually all. It looks a bit of a complicated, but if you go to the Scala code of this function, you will notice that it's 
just a giant switch statement with the different known types for Flink. And if it's like an enum, that just serializes as a num, try option, and whatever else, there is a case class one here, which is doing the case class serialization. But you might notice that there is no, no mentions of, of uh, interfaces or sealed traits of algebraic data types here. So it falls down to the generic type info and hello, Creo. Uh, so let's just check what will happen if we try to serialize something with sealed traits here with Creo. And the results is almost uh, looking even, even worse than it was before, because if we serialize just a, like, the concrete version of our class with Creo, it's already bad. But if we serialize it like as an ADT, like a top level version, uh, so like it's either foo or bar, it becomes even worse. Why? Oh, it's already bad, but it's even worse now. And uh, if you open if you open the resulting bytes, what was it serialized to? It will give you a hint. So if you serialize a concrete version of the type, it looks nice like almost nothing, five bytes. And if you see the ADT version, it looks not that nice anymore because you see that Creo has no idea about what the resulting type is. It can be anything because Creo is Java specific. So there is a fully qualified, don't, uh, fully qualified name here, which is uh, not that good for performance because, and so it, it takes more time to generate this thing, it takes more time to read, and takes more storage to, 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 to store. Uh, so Creo has no idea that this ADT is an enclosed type, there is nothing else than just to these implementations. It's a Java library, it has no idea about that Scala stuff. So it encodes a full type name, but the problem is that the Scala compiler knows why don't we have a way to uh, ask Scala compiler to help us if we're using Scala? Compiler is, is your friend usually, but uh, usually not, not, not immediately. Um, so of course you can implement your own type information. It's just an interface. There is a billion of abstract method you need to implement if you try to do it, maybe 15 or something. Um, and. Um, so for example, to solve this problem with the ADT or with something else, you can just have a case class serialized type information for your uh, net, for foo and bar classes, create a custom type information which will explain to Flink that, okay, there are only two implementations, don't worry. And, uh, but it's still a lot of boilerplate code. I tried and it's, it's not that funny. And also what happens if you have some sort of a nested type problem. So for example, you have some sort of a custom timestamp or whatever, which is not fitting into a POJO structure and you would like, and it's, it's everywhere, but it's not like a top level type. It's somewhere nested. And in this case, the plugin or this, uh, the macro function, which generates a type information for you will not take this type information from the outside because it's most probably it was written a long time ago and still there. And, um, it's because it has no idea about nested types. It's, if, and when you're inside of this macro, there is no escape. It will generate it as it knows, even if you try to supply something externally. Uh, it's actually not the first, uh, we're not the first who encounter this problem writing Scala and Flink. It's not the encountered the problem writing Scala in general. Uh, there was a library called Flink Shapeless. It's uh, long dead and abandoned. But the idea behind this library is quite nice. So let's play uh, an, a nice game with Scala uh, developers and not try to build a wild one joint macro which will do everything for you. Let's just uh, make a compound types through the shapeless library. Shapeless library is a very weird and specific Scala library to do a type level programming. So it's not a, not a macro, it's just a programming on types. It's like programming on C++ templates on compile time on the complexity of understanding what's going on there. And the problem with shapeless because of this magic is that if you have large case class with 50 fields, for us it might take maybe five minutes to compile because of this magic happening inside and to understand if, if it fails after five minutes, it will be a disaster to understand what failed because you have a dump for 10 kilobytes. Uh, and we decided to just try to re-implement this Flink shapeless ideas, but with a, just a bit different approach. So 
uh, let's just use not use shapeless to derive this key, this type information, and uh, and let's play nice with Scala so we will uh, be with implicit and so on with case classes. We'll work nested with nested types, and it it, it should not be a reimplementation of the string serialization. It should be just a wrapper, just a small wrapper between the Scala and the proper users of Scala and the Flink. So it should be the same performance and uh, it should happily handle classes and with the rich data models like we have because we tried to resurrect the Flink shapeless and uh, I was not able to uh, afford waiting 10 minutes until my project compiles. Uh, so just a very small demo about how it looks like from the user perspective. So it's like a, f a famous joke, like, is the code readable? And someone answers, no, it's still Scala. But uh, <laughs> but it's still Scala, sorry. So we have our like ADT uh, structure here and the small function which serializes it to array of bytes through this uh, type information thing from Flink. So it's not a like full-blown job of Flink, but it's kind of a very small part. And we try to serialize it and get the length here, so if we so here we are playing nice and we're importing the Apache Flink API Scala uh, import and we can run it and wait a bit because um, you know Scala and usually Scala developers are going into suspend mode when it compiles so you don't even notice that it takes some time. Yeah, so for the regular version, it's like 40, 41 bytes, which is quite a lot and you, you know why and here we just change the imports here, just uh, just a yet another set of imports, and we remove this one and try to rebuild and see what will happen. And it will compile and compile and finally it runs. Uh, so now it should be, yeah, nice, much nicer, it's three, and we're trying to serialize our ADT as an ADT and not as a weird uh, thing with a fully qualified class name. Um, so, uh, for the performance, it's almost the same as for the uh, Flink serialization. So, as Creo as a baseline, like this, the slow one with the fully qualified uh, class name, is here if you encode the foo as a concrete type without anything related to ADTs and abstract types and so on. It's like 38 and uh, 39 and 38 here, so it's almost the same. Uh, because we're not trying to be so smart as Creo. But this library, if it plays nice with a Scala, Scala way of doing things, it allows you not only just to have nice performance for some cases where not covered by the Flink itself, because you can uh, always plug a custom serializer there, even if they are somewhere deep inside of your uh, class structure. And so now you can have some sort of trade-off between state side performance or whatever metric you're trying to optimize because in some cases you know better than your data is a very specific. So I will tell you a couple of anecdotes like about the string serializer that uh, it is generic enough but sometimes you know that you only have SCAI strings for example for IDs and maybe you can somehow speed it up or for our use case, we have quite a lot of arrays of primitives stored in the, within the state, and these in primitives are not that big, so maybe you can do something smart about var length of coding, so you can make the state size much smaller, if you can, if you can. So, uh, just a short story about strings. So we have just a lot of strings, it's identifier of customers, requests, products, variants, and so on and so forth and it's everywhere in the state and um if you see the, 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 the graph of uh, this flame graph of serialization, you will notice that it's actually 30% of all the whole time of the serialization and deserialization is happening within the string. It's not because the string serialization is slow. It's nice. Just there is too many strings in our data model. Maybe it's different for your code base, but for us, yes, there is a lot of strings. Just for example, as search results will also encode the products which were shown, the variants which were shown, and uh, some metadata about products. So the response we uh, process through our streaming application is, uh, is quite quite huge, and almost half of all the stuff is just strings. Uh, so if you check the string serializer, serializer from the Flink code base, it looks quite smart. So it just uh, 
does, does the variable length encoding of the string length and then does a character uh, with a variable length encoding. Nothing complicated here. And we also thought that it's quite nice, so there nothing can be done here. But just for the baseline, we decided that why we don't just use the GDK's default Y to serialize strings, like uh, throw everything away and use like read UTF and write UTF and compare what will happen. And like it doesn't look that, that smart, like a variable length encoding of characters. But uh, when we saw the benchmark results, we were quite surprised because on even, even on different GDK version, it's almost double uh, that fast to use the simple one, like just the write UTF and read UTF. And you might wonder well, why it is happening. And uh, actually, uh, you can compare the two implementations on the left and on the right. And the main thing on the left is that we're writing characters one by one. Yes, they are variable encoded. It like, looks like a C code and not a Java, which is, should be performant. But the problem is that writing everything byte by byte uh, breaks some uh, something inside of the hotspot uh, optimizer so it cannot unroll the loop so you don't have enough of the data parallelism on the hardware level. And in this case, there is just a buffer for arrays. This thing is perfectly unrolled and actually it is being encoding four characters at once on a hardware level. Sorry, I won't throw, so sh so show you assembly because no one is uh, expected, but mm, there will be a link on all the benchmarks uh, uh, later it's on a GitHub, you can run by yourself and see the difference. But the main difference is enrolling. And, uh, and the main problem that the format of the serialization here and here is different. So it, it won't be that smart idea, just replace uh, this by that and hope that everything will be fine with your save points. Uh, most probably it will be, but uh, still it can be problematic. But uh, for us, it, was, it allowed us to um, uh, and the footprint, the footprint is almost the same. So I tried to do serialization of different types of strings like emojis, Chinese characters, and the CEI strings, and the difference is almost the same. The only difference is that here is the variable length encoding of the string length, and here is not variable length encoding. That's actually the main difference. Um, and it allowed us to sw switching the serializer and being able to switch serializers uh, for particular cases, even for particular classes, uh, allowed us to speed things up, uh, not dramatically, but get some like 20% improvement on the throughput of our jobs for the bootstrapping. And yet another cool story is uh, 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 arrays of primitives. So as we do a lot of different sliding window estimates for different scopes, that's quite a lot of them. Uh, so what we do is just some sort of per day uh, buckets and aggregate on top of that. And it, it, uh, by, by, uh, under the hood, it's still the array of primitives, array of integers. And the same thing if you estimate some percentiles for, for something. It's uh, under, uh, so the algorithm itself is like account means cache or something looking like this, but under the hood is still array of primitives. And what do we know about this primitive? That they are usually not that large. So for most, like 90% of all the, uh, ah, there is a picture for that. Uh, like 90% of all the uh, integers we store there are, can, can fit into eight bytes, eight bits, and maybe 99% can fit in 16. But so it's kind of an overhead to always serialize integer into four bytes. Let's, if we have a way to plug our own serializers without breaking everything, Let's implement our own serializer for, for, for arrays of integers, but with a variable length encoding. And here comes a very small demo. It's not really a demo, just uh, showing you how, how it looks like. So I got the variant implementation from Google Bazel code base. It looks nice, and it's the first Google search results when you search for variant on Java. Um, but uh, it, it, the general idea is that we serialize uh, integers in the blocks of seven bits. And the, the last bit is a sign that is there anything else below this byte? So in, in the worst case, in the worst case, your, uh, your variant encoding can be less efficient than the, just the 
proper integer 32 bits encoding because for the very large integers. For, but we have almost no uh, such uh, integers at all, and most of them are here. So what we were expecting that when we plug something like variable length encoder for arrays of integers and longs, we will get some nice improvement on the state size, a nice improvement on the time it takes to save point your job and this, the maybe, but uh, sacrificing throughput because you need to do a bit of a more operations while writing a variable length integer. But when we did some sort of a benchmark, uh, that was actually a surprise for me. That um, for it's it's just the default implementation, 32 bits uh, for for in, for any integer we plug there, it's almost the same. But for the variant encoding, you see that if your integer is uh, smaller than 28 significant bits, most probably this thing even works faster and it comes it more effect in a more effective way and it works faster, which is like a win-win situation. Everyone is happy. Um, and this is actually happening not because of the magic somewhere. If you check the implementation of the, how, how it works under the hood, <laughs> So the code of writing integers in Flink is actually the one from the GDK, and it's just a, like bit shift and write, bit shift and write, and it's happening four times for different bytes. Like so, you writing four bytes in a stream uh, one by one, nothing special here. And if you do do the same thing, but with a variable length encoding, you do almost the same, but each of these writes is conditional. So. Okay, we take this uh, seven bits thing from the search. So if your integer is smaller than 127, for example, you just write this one and return. That's all. It's kind of a conditional write, which is extremely nice. And it explains well why this thing is faster than that thing. And um, having even lower disk footprint for the save points and the snapshots and whatever you want to serialize to. Uh, as a general result from the, from the business perspective, we got some nice improvements on the state size. So it was like 100 gigabytes at the beginning, now it's more like 40 gigabytes, which is extremely nice and most probably is because of this variant encoding of uh, primitive arrays. And the, the throughput is also improved because we are not using Creo anymore, which is nice. So everyone is absolutely happy with this. Uh, but uh, the main thing is how to use it, it's, it's how to use it for you. So it's not just I'm um, telling you cool stories and then I disappear and that's all. No. Um, um, <laughs> so for the string civilization uh, anecdote and improvement, uh, we already made like a um, small ticket about that, and there is some sort of an implementation which tries to backport the ideas from the GDK uh, string serializer to the Flink serializer, but maintaining the wire compatibility. So it should be like a no-brainer thing. So it just does the same thing, but faster twice, which is nice. Um, for the var length encoding of primitives, we also considering making a contribution to Flink, but it's more more complicated because it changes the wire format, so it needs to be discussed. What the, the ADT support for the Flink Scala? That's a good question. Is it really needed for someone? Because uh, looks like the Flink is slowly drifting from Scala to the land of Java, so that's a good question. And all the uh, benchmarks I uh, shown here on the slides are available on GitHub. So you can clone them. The talk also will be available somewhere, most probably. Uh, the library itself is uh, the Flink ADT. It's on Maven Central and it's on GitHub. And so you can just plug, replace the imports, and uh, and submit issues, most probably, after that, to this project. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think that's all. And most probably we have some... So Thank you very much, uh, Roman. Um, also for your contributions, I think that's very valuable that we even can try it out our own. Um, so, are there any questions to Roman? Yeah. Thanks for the talk. Um, I would like to ask if you benchmarked it against our serialization. Uh, uh, no, I never tried, but most probably you can do it quite easily. So I've never used Avro for the last maybe three years or two years, so yeah. don't so have we, a, we, But we, as far as I 
heard somewhere on the internet, and everyone is uh, right on the internet. So it's a bit faster than Creo, but it's not that fast as the uh, case class serialization. But I don't know why. Okay, thanks. Any more questions? Then I have one question. What happens if I add a new type to the ADT? Like a new implementation of the interface? Uh -huh. That's a good question. It's a more question about the uh, state evolution in Scala. And as uh, there is no state evolution for keys classes, there is no state evolution for ADTs. Uh, but actually under the hood, it encodes them in an order they were encountered in the code. So it depends where you add your keys class in this compilation unit. If it will be the last one, most probably everything will be fine. But uh, there comes a question, what will happen if you try to restore your state on the previous version of an application? So it will try to deserialize to a non-existent class and most probably Probably it will just <laughs> destroy everything. And probably the same for removing uh, implementations from the ADT, right? Uh, yes, I think so. But if you are not trying to deserialize these things, so like there was some stale uh, member of the sealed trait and you are not using it and you are never deserializing to it, most probably it will be fine. But I've never tried. And like, uh, it was enough for me to know that there is no state evolution for case classes. So why should I uh, implement it for sealed traits? Okay. So I think we have still some more minutes. Anyone is interested? Okay. Then let's thank Roman again.